welcome to all of you. Uh, this is my first official event as the new president of USIP, and what a thrill, frankly, to be here with you and Da Sang Suu Kyi. Uh, her first visit to the United States in 20 years. No? 40 years. <laughs> And, and she chose to come to the Institute of Peace for her first public address. So we're thrilled by that. We have wonderful partners in the Asian Society and the, uh, the Blue Moon uh, Society. And we have a great relationship with the State Department. Secretary Clinton is here today. Uh, a number of her colleagues are here, Patrick Murphy, Michael Posner, and Kirk Campbell. Uh, in addition, I'd like to particularly recognize a couple of our board members, George Moose, Judy Ansley, Nancy Zirkin, and Priscilla Clapp, who is a member of our International Advisory Board, but without her, I don't think this event would have, would have occurred. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Aung San Suu Kyi for coming, and I'd like to turn things over to uh, Henrietta Poor for her remarks. Well, I join with Jim, and I uh, want to tell you that this is a, an extremely large and important pleasure that we have in welcoming all of you here today. It is a, an event in honor of a remarkable individual, Da Aung San Suu Kyi, and we welcome you and your delegation to Washington. We have followed your struggle over these past two decades and have been inspired by your unwavering commitment to advancing human rights, equity, and justice in your country. Secretary Clinton, we are honored by your presence today. Thank you for joining us, and thank you and your Burma team, many of whom are with you here today, for your leadership in strengthening U.S.-Burma relations. My colleagues and I at the Asia Society are delighted to co-host today's event, along with the United States Institute of Peace. And Jim, congratulations to you on your appointment as president of this great institution. And we look forward to continuing our work together. I am pleased to say that Asia Society's relationship with Da Aung San Suu Kyi goes back to the late 1960s and early 1970s, when she was living in New York City and working for the United Nations. We are grateful for this long-standing friendship, and we are glad that so many of her friends and supporters could join us today to welcome her back to the United States. Asia Society has been organizing Burma-related public programming focused on human rights, health, political developments, and regional issues, as well as art exhibitions and cultural performances since its founding in 1956 by John D. Rockefeller III. In 2009, we established a task force devoted to improving Burma-U.S. relations, which we have followed up with track two work, with an emphasis on strengthening relations between our countries, promoting cult cultural exchanges, and marshalling expertise in support of the transition underway in Burma. Let me conclude by saying that we recognize that this is a most important moment in Burma's history, and we are committed to continuing this work. Asia Society and our partners in this effort stand ready to help. Thank you. Jim? I have to introduce somebody who has no need to be introduced, Secretary Clinton. Well, it's wonderful to be back here at uh, USIP, especially for this extraordinary, auspicious occasion. Uh, I want to thank uh, USIP and congratulate Jim Marshall upon becoming president. We certainly look forward to working with you. And I want to thank the Asia Society and Henrietta Four and uh, all who uh, represent the commitment that started in the 1950s, but has uh, certainly stood the test of time, and we very much enjoy working with you as well. Now, the purpose for this gathering is quite an exciting one, uh, because we have here an opportunity for uh, 
someone who has represented uh, the struggle for freedom and democracy, uh, for human rights and opportunity, uh, not only in her own country, but uh, seen as such around the world. So it's wonderful to see Suchi back in Washington as a free and forceful leader of a country opening up to the world in ways that would have been difficult to imagine even recently. Those flickers of progress that uh, President Obama spoke of uh, last uh, a year ago summer um, have been growing and strengthening in the times since. Hundreds of prisoners of conscience have been released over the past year, including some just this week. Opposition political parties have been legalized and their members have won seats in parliament. Restrictions on the press and on freedom of assembly have eased. We've seen laws uh, that have been enacted to expand the rights of workers to form labor unions and to outlaw forced labor. And the government has reached fragile ceasefires in some long running ethnic conflicts. Suchi's um, courage and moral leadership never wavered through years of house arrest and persecution. And she and other opposition leaders have now joined with President Thein Sein and the new government to take the courageous steps necessary to drive these reforms. I have met with the president twice uh, in Naypyidaw and then in this summer in Cambodia. I look forward to welcoming him to New York next week for the United Nations General Assembly. This morning at the State Department, Su Chi and I had the chance to talk about the work still ahead. And there is a lot of work. I think one of the important reasons uh, for her visit at this time uh, is to remind us of how much more still lies ahead from strengthening the rule of law and democratic institutions uh, to addressing the challenges in many of the ethnic conflicts and in uh, Rakhine State. The government and the opposition need to continue to work together to unite the country, heal the wounds of the past, and carry the reforms forward. That is also key to guard against backsliding uh, because there are forces that would take the country in the wrong direction if given the chance. So we in the State Department and in the Obama administration are certainly the first to say that the process of reform uh, must continue. Uh, political prisoners remain in detention ongoing ethnic and sectarian violence continues to undermine progress toward national reconciliation, stability, and lasting peace. Some military contacts with North Korea persist. And further reforms are required to strengthen the rule of law, increase transparency, and address constitutional challenges. But the United States is committed to standing with the government and the people of Burma to support this uh, progress that has begun but is still uh, a work in progress. We've taken steps to exchange ambassadors, ease economic sanctions, and pave the way for American companies to invest in the country in a way that advances rather than undermines continued reforms. And we are in close contact with government and opposition leaders. Uh, our first ever ambassador to uh, this new Burma, uh, Derek Mitchell, is here with us today. And he, along with the team that Assistant Secretary Kurt Campbell lead, uh, are uh, not only in constant uh, communication, but ongoing consultation uh, with many representatives of different uh, constituencies in Burma uh, so that we can provide uh, the help and support that is necessary and appropriate. Last December, I had the honor of visiting Su Chi in the house that was once her prison. And we talked about many things, including uh, the challenge of moving from protest to politics, from symbol to stateswoman. Uh, that is what her country needs from her now. 
I know a little bit about how hard that transition can be. Uh, it exposes you to a whole new sort of criticism uh, and even attack and requires the kind of pragmatic compromise and co coalition building that is the lifeblood of politics but may disappoint uh, the purists who have held faith with you uh, while you were on the outside. Yet in the months since Su Chi walked out of house arrest and into the political arena, she has proven herself to be a natural, campaigning hard, legislating well, and staying focused on what can be done right now and tomorrow and the day after tomorrow to move her country forward. So I think you are in for a great opportunity uh, this afternoon, as will be many American audiences in the days ahead as she has a very generous uh, schedule of activities. I unfortunately have to uh, depart back to the State Department, uh, but it will be um, certainly a great pleasure for me now to introduce someone who is not only a Nobel laureate and a hero to millions, but also a busy member of parliament and the leader of her political party. Please welcome Aung San Suu Kyi. Thank you for a very warm welcome, and it's a great pleasure to see many familiar old faces. I was at an Asia Society meeting, I think about over 40 years ago in New York. It is nothing like this, but uh, I remember that it was interesting, and there was great interest in Burma, even in those days. I've been asked to speak on US-Burma bilateral relations. Uh, before I start on that, I would like to say how happy I am to be with you today, to be with the people of the United States who have stood by us through our hard years of struggle for democracy. We are not yet at the end of our struggle, but we are getting there. We have passed the first hurdle, but there are many more hurdles to cross. And I hope that you will be with us as we make our way to the goal for which our people have been longing for 50 years because military dictatorship came to Burma in 1962 and we're now in 2012. That's half a century. That's a long, long time for people to live under a dictatorship. So what we have to do in the future is not just to build democracy in Burma, but to rebuild our nation in a democratic mode. And in this, we look to help from our friends who understand and who appreciate the value of democracy and democratic values. Speaking of US-Burma bilateral relations, bilateral relations are shaped by geopolitics and by history, and these days also by the communications revolution and globalization. The case of our two countries is particularly illustrative of the dimensions of geopolitics and history. Because we're situated between China and India, the two biggest powers in Asia, and because we are in the border of South Asia and South East Asia, our position is unique. And any relation with Burma must, must take into consideration this situation. As soon as Burma started re-engaging with the United States, or the other way around, as soon as we started re-engaging with one another, questions were asked as to how this would impact on US-China relations. People 
naturally associate US-China relations with US-Burma relations. There were many questions asked as to whether the United States engagement with Burma was aimed at containing the influence of China in Asia. This is a natural question, and one that I think, if we have to answer honestly, cannot be answered simply. Because I do not think that any country could claim, either the United States or China or Burma, that our relations have nothing to do with the relations that we have with other countries around us. And it is only natural that United States relations with, Bur with Burma should have some impact on United States relations with China. And also that our relations with the United States would impact to a certain degree on our relations with China. But I think that this could be taken forward in a positive fashion. It does not mean that because Burma is engaging now with the United States, that its relations with China should in any way deteriorate. Also, it does not mean that because the United States is engaging with Burma, it should in any way be seen as a hostile step towards China. We can use our new situation to strengthen relations between all three countries. For us, to put it very simply, it would be to our advantage for the United States and China to establish friendly relations. This would help us a great deal, and this is what I look forward to. Burma has had a good history of preserving friendship with many different countries following many different ideologies. As it was one of the first countries to recognize communist China back in the 1950s, it also it was a country which had particularly warm re relations with India to its west. And when we became independent, we were considered the country most likely to succeed in Southeast Asia. This is a, an honor that we have lost over the last few decades, but we think that we can regain this honor with the help of our friends, including the United States. As I said, bilateral relations are a product not just of geopolitics, but of history. It might come as a surprise to some of you that historically, US relations with Burma were seen in the light of education and humanitarian help rather than economics or politics. To begin with, the first American to be well known, to become well known in Burma was Judson, who was a missionary. I can never pronounce his first name, Adoniram, I think. It's a very strange uh, name for me to pronounce. Uh, he was a missionary who came to Burma in the early 19th century. I have the date somewhere, I can look it up. Uh, and he became, he worked very hard to, be, to establish a basis for his missionary work in Burma. He gained enough of the confidence of the Burmese court to be able to reach out to some of the princes. He wrote the first uh, Burmese English dictionary and um, he was widely respected. He lived in Burma many years and died just off the coast of Maulmain when he had started out on an ocean voyage. So obviously his fate was linked to Burma in very many ways. One of our first colleges was named after him. Back in the old days before we had Rangoon University, we had two colleges, uh, University College and Judson College. Judson College was named art after the missionary I mentioned, and uh, it was, uh, it, it was a um, college founded by missionaries. So missionary work was the way in which Americans first came to Burma, and missionaries engaged in a lot of educational enterprises. It is interesting that in the days of colonialism, 
there was a distinct difference between the educational system introduced by American missionaries and those introduced by Catholic missionaries. The great majority of uh, Christian institutions in Burma were either Catholic or, I, I mean Christian educational institutions in Burma, were either Catholic or Baptist. Uh, the Catholics, of course, had convents and boys' schools run by Catholic priests, while the American Baptist Mission set up a number of schools for girls as well as for boys. The girls' schools were particularly well known. The difference between the educational institutions run by the American missionaries and the Catholic missionaries was that the American missionaries, while of course they proselytized, that was their job after all, they were very keen on preserving the traditional culture and manners of the local people. So that in the ABM, the American Baptist Missionary Schools, the girls wore Burmese costume, whereas in the convents they wore gym tunics. And, uh, and also, they were more inclined to take up Christian names, whereas the great majority of girls who went to ABM schools retained their Burmese names and their Burmese costume. The American missionaries also encouraged the uh, preservation of Burmese manners so that the products of the ABM schools were considered very proper, very well educated, uh, but also very much aware of Burmese manners of courtesy. My mother went to one of these schools. She went to a very famous ABM uh, school in Rangoon, named, uh, known as the Kemadine, Kemadine Girls High School because it was in the Kemadine area of Rangoon. And all her life, she was stamped by her years there. Very proper, very disciplined, very precise, very elegant. And now I myself went to the English Methodist High School for a number of years, which is actually an American Methodist institution, although it is called the English Methodist High School. I learned there a lot of hymns. It, was, it, it's a, it is ironic because my mother in the days of colonialism when she went to the ABM girls' school wore Burmese costume. Whereas when I went to the English Methodist girls' school after independence, I had to wear skirts. Very strange. But uh, I also noticed that there was less uh, encouragement of Burmese manners in the English Methodist girls' school than they had been in my mother's school back in the 1930s, I suppose, when she was there. So education was considered, was very closely associated with American missionaries in those days, and also health care. I think many of you will have heard of the famous Dr. Seagrave, the Burma surgeon, who spent a lot of years in the Shan states and ran a very, very well-known hospital. And when I was growing up in the 1950s after independence, one of the very best hospitals in Burma was considered to be that run by the Seventh-day Adventists. So we associated American relations with Burma more with education and humanitarian help than with politics or economic <coughs> or democracy. Uh, I, the first books I ever borrowed was from the Uses Library in Rangoon. So that also was well known. And, of course, we mustn't overlook the importance of Hollywood films and pop music. Uh, that also had a great influence on the young uh, of Burma in my day. And I think it still continues to have a lot of influence on the young of Burma now, <coughs> as on the young everywhere else in the world, in spite of the years that we st spent under military dictatorship when we were cut off from almost everything outside our own country. The years of military rule eroded the relationship between Burma and the United States. Um, by the way, I think 
I should make a point of saying that there are people who refer to Burma as Nyama, and it's entirely a matter of choice. I refer to Burma as Burma because this is the name by which it was known when we became independent, and this is the name to which I am used. But it is for each individual to make his or her own choice as to which name he or she uses. The relationship between our countries deteriorated beginning in 1962, when the first military uh, regime took over. Well, the very first time was in 1958, but that was for a couple of years, and then there were democratic elections, and the civilian government was restored. But uh, military dictatorship, dictatorship was once again instituted in 1962, and I think we can say that it was more or less uh, unchanged until 2010. It is true that uh, the, uh, what was it known as, the caretaker government, the military caretaker government, took on the name of the Burma Socialist Program Party, and it was supposed to be a socialist one-party government rather than a military regime, but in effect, it was very much dominated by the military. Since 2010, of course, things have changed to a certain extent. I'll come back to that later. To go back to the years of military rule, there was general, general xenophobia under the Burma Socialist Program Party. It was not just the United States, but the Western world in general that was viewed with suspicion uh, by the regime led by General Nguyen, the then dictator. Because of this xenophobia, we lost many of our links with the West. In the old days, we had sent many of our young people to study in institutions in Europe and in the United States. Even before independence, we had had scholars studying in the United States, quite a number, usually sponsored by missionary organizations. And after independence, we, had, we expanded our cultural and educational ties with with the United States, and because of the communist insurgencies that started soon after we achieved independence, we also had military relations with your country. But after 1962, these relations dwindled to almost nothing. It was not just with the United States, but with the West in general, that the military regime did not wish to deal. Particularly after 1988, as I'm sure all of you know, there was a democratic uprising throughout the country in 1988 when people asked for multi-party democracy. They had seen that one-party dictatorship only brought the country from a state of prosperity to one of near poverty, where we were declared uh, one of the least developed countries in the world. As a result, of uh, this uprising, the military put down the demonstrators very brutally. There was much bloodshed, and the following years were some of the hardest our country has ever had to go through. The, the United States, from the very beginning, stood firmly by the forces for democracy, and for this, I would like to thank all of you, because when people are in a difficult situation. We need friends. We need friends who are strong and who are committed. The United States was committed to democratic values and proved to be a good friend to all of us who struggled for democracy. But in the process, relations between the governments of the two, two countries deteriorated. Less and less engagement. And here I would like to say that I have always been for engagement. You can engage in different ways. You can engage as friends, or you can engage as people who have agreed to disagree. And it is, to me, a sad thing that engagement between our two countries came to almost nothing during two decades or more. But now the situation has changed. Because of what happened in 2010, to begin with, 
the military regime um, was replaced by a civilian regime elected in 2010. I will be quite frank and say that we have grave doubts about the way in which those elections were conducted. And I think even the United Nations, which is, which is generally uh, very, very cautious about such remarks, has admitted that the elections of 2010 were deeply flawed. And the government that came, uh, that was established as a result of the, these elections was made up largely of ex-members of the military. Many of them had in fact been in the government, the military government just before the election, or just until a few months uh, before the elections when they left the military to contest as um, members of the National Assembly. The change brought about in 2010 was questioned by very many who felt that it was not enough just to have elections, which, as I mentioned earlier, were considered to be deeply flawed, and to have a so-called elected civilian government. Democratic practices had to be seen. Democratic institutions had to be built. And the world was interested in finding out how this process was going to go. And the United States, in particular, was interested in how far along the path to democracy Burma was actually going to go. I would say that the real changes came about in 2011. I was released towards the end of 2010, but my party was then operating as an unregistered political party, or shall we say deregistered. We had been registered way back in 1989 to contest the elections of 1990, where we won over 80% of the seats, but the results of the elections were not honored. So we remained with great difficulty as a political party, still registered, but not allowed to operate as a political party. During those years, I would say, that US-Burma bilateral relations was more democracy to democracy rather than government to government. After 2010, things began to change a little. There was a greater push for re-engagement with Burma because of the new civilian government and because I had been released, although my my party still remained deregistered because we had refused to take part in the 2010 elections. To take part in the 2010 elections, our party would have been obliged to expel all its members who were under detention, including myself. And also, we would have been obliged to reject the results of the 1990 elections. And moreover, uh, we would have to take an oath to uphold and defend the constitution of 2008. This is the constitution which we, we felt was not conducive to the building of a genuine democratic society. Apart from the fact that it allowed for 25 unelected military representatives to, be, uh, to, be, to take part in all the assemblies from the national to the local level. It also provided for the commander in chief to take over all powers of government at any time that he considered necessary for the sake of the country. For this and other reasons, we felt that we could not take the oath to defend and protect the 2008 constitution. But there's a little story to that. I think it should be a lesson to all of us that when you read the Constitution, you just don't read uh, the body of the Constitution. You, have, you should read the appendices as well, <laughs> uh, which I have to say we did to begin with, but we forgot to reread them. So in 2011, when President Uthain Singh made it possible for our country, for our, for our party to be re-registered, 
it, had, it was done on the understanding that uh, the regulations for the elections and for party reg registration would be changed so we would not have to expel any of our members who happen to be under detention. And uh, secondly, we would have to agree to abide by and to respect the Constitution, which is fine by us. I think everybody has to do that in any country. And, uh, and also, the, uh, the Speaker of the Upper House made a statement to the effect that 1990 elections had been won by the NLD. So this amounted to a, a withdrawal, withdrawal of the necessity to reject the results of the 1990 elections. Well, we went in for the by-elections in um, April, last, last April, a few months ago. These, we had, we contested 45 seats. These were the seats vacated by members of the government because under the constitution, if you become a member of the government, you have to vacate your parliamentary seat. So we contested 44 of them. We won 43. I'm very annoyed to say that we lost one. <laughs> but. Uh, this has made us the biggest opposition party in our National Assembly. And when you consider that there are altogether 651 members, 44 is not too much. But we found just before we, uh, just after the election, that we had forgotten to look into the words of the oath that we would have to take. These remain the same as the previous election regu regulations we had to undertake to defend and protect the Constitution. Well, there was a lot of uh, soul searching over this. We wondered whether, on principle, we should refuse to do this. But politics is about compromise. It's about being practical. It's about being down to earth and to do what is best under the circumstances. The people who had voted for us were very anxious for us to get into the National Assembly. They understood our dilemma with regard to the wording of the oath, but still the great majority of our people wanted us to enter the National Assembly and to serve them through the legislative process. On top of that, many of the ethnic nationality parties that were already, that already had representatives within the National Assembly were keen for us to join them because they felt that this would strengthen us as, I do not know whether I should refer to them as opposition parties, but certainly they felt that they could work together with us and that to a certain extent we could counter the overwhelming influence of the uh, Union, Solidarity and Development Party, which had won over 80% 80, 80 of the seats. So we thought about this very carefully, and in the end I decided that uh, as we were the ones who had made the mistake of not looking through all the appendices carefully, we would have to confess our mistake and to respect the will of the people who had voted for us and also to respect the desire of our friendly parties to work with us and we decided to take the oath. Well, I took it, but uh, we still stand by a plat party platform, by election platform, which is first rule of law, Second, an end to ethnic conflict in our country. And third, necessary amendments to the Constitution. And as the Constitution itself allows for amendments, but only with over 75% of the votes, which means we'd have to get at least, not just all the civilian votes, but at least once one member of the military bloc to vote with us, because they have 25%. Still, I think uh, we did the right thing when we decided to enter Parliament. I think this is when uh, we had to start thinking very seriously about new US-Burma bilateral relations. 
Burma had certainly started out on the process of democratization. But how far will it go? How sustainable is it? How genuine it, it, is it? Those are the questions. I think these questions have not yet been answered in, it, in their entirety. How genuine is the process? How sustainable it is? It will depend on all of us. First of all, it will depend on the people of Burma. The people of Burma, as represented by those in the legislature, will have a lot to do with it. We must also remember that the reform process was initiated by President Upeng Singh. I believe that he is keen on democratic reforms. But how the executive goes about implementing these reforms is what we have to watch. And when we think of democracy, we have to think of the three props of democracy, the three arms of democracy, the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. We cannot judge how genuine or how sustainable the democratization of Burma is simply by looking at the executive. Neither can we do it by looking simply at the legislature, nor by looking simply at the judiciary. Actually, if you were to look just at the judiciary in Burma, you'd probably see nothing, <laughs> because this is our weakest arm. And this is what we are trying to build up in the legislature, uh, through the legislature itself and through the Committee for the Rule of Law, of which I'm fortunate, or unfortunate, I don't know, to be chairman. And uh, we all have to work together. So new US-Burma bilateral relations, I would like to be founded firmly in the recognition of the need to give equal weight to the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary, and to judge the progress of democratization in Burma by how strong all these institutions are and how well able to work together as a whole to establish democratic practices in our country. Our people have been divorced from, from democratic values and democratic practices for many decades. In fact, they say, many of them say, very, very frankly, we really don't know what democracy is, but we don't want dictatorship. <coughs> when they voted for us, when we w went around the country before the by-elections of April, I asked many of them why they wanted democracy. And they usually say, would say, we want to be able to lead our own lives freely. They wanted the freedom to be able to decide their own destiny. This was a very simple wish on the part of many of our people. They also wished to be taken out of poverty. Burma has become very poor over the years under military dictatorship. And US-Burma bilateral relations will also need to be built on policies that will help to raise us out of poverty. For many years, the dictatorship in Burma claimed that US sanctions had had no effect whatsoever and they did not care. But then lately, in, in the last years of uh, military rule, U U United States sanctions were blamed for all the economic ills of Burma. Not just the economic ills, but other ills as well. And uh, there is great eagerness for these sanctions to be removed. On my part, I do not think that we need to cling on to sanctions unnecessarily, because I want our people to be responsible for their own destiny and not to depend too much on external props. We will need external help. We will need the help of our friends abroad from all over the world. But in the end, we have to build our own democracy for ourselves. And we would like US 
Burma relations to be, to be founded firmly on the recognition of the need for our own people to be accountable for their own destiny. We need the kind of help that has been given to us by the United States historically in the fields of education and health, in the fields of humanitarian aid. Our education system is in a shambles. Many of our people are barely educated. 15% of our children do not go to school at all. And of the rest, hardly 20% make it through high school. So Burma's educational system is in dire need of reform. Not just, and we need practical help. Our health system is in exactly the same situation. We need great help in the, with, health, with, with education, with health, with the building up of democratic institutions. As I mentioned earlier, the weakest of these institutions is that of the judiciary. But we have to work very hard at it. Without rule of law, you cannot have the kind of economic reforms that will lift our people out of poverty. Economic relations between the US and Burma seem to have come to the forefront over the last several months. There is great eagerness on the part of international businesses to invest in Burma. Recently, uh, we produced a draft of foreign direct investment law, and this has been widely discussed. The first draft as it came out was uh, considered disappointing by many uh, would-be investors. But some changes have been made to this, and I believe that it will prove to be a lot more attractive than the first draft that came out last month. But whatever laws we produce, without the rule of law, without the kind of judicial system that will be there to make sure that the laws are upheld, and obeyed, it will not provide anybody with either security or with the freedom necessary for them to operate effectively in our own country. So while the United States seems to be concentrating a lot on the economic aspect of its relations with my country, I hope they will do this in full awareness of the need to promote rule of law and to help the president and his executive to carry out the reforms they have in mind, as well as to help the legislature to strengthen itself as a body that will protect the people's interests through the laws that they enact and the laws that they amend and the laws that they simply just have to get rid of because there are many laws in our country which do greater harm than good. Well, not too many, well, se several, let's put it, especially the laws under which people are put and which uh, activists have been placed in prison over the last decade. I think many of you will have heard that recently there was a release of prisoners in Burma, 500, of which we understand about 90 are political prisoners, which would mean by our count that um, uh, over 200 remain, 200, 200 political prisoners remain in prison. On top of that, this is according to the list of the NLD. There are other lists which are longer than this. I think the list uh, that is accepted by the United States uh, is rather longer than ours. So that would mean by United States count more than 300 of, or even more than 400 people still room. Pris uh, political prisoners remain in prison today. By our count, about over 200 remain. All these will have to be freed. If you talk about genuine democratization, there should be not a single political prisoner in the country. There should be no prisoners of conscience because in a genuine democracy, people should be able to act in accordance with the, their conscience so long as they are not infringing on the rights of others. Rule of law and human rights cannot be separated. 
it says in the preamble to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that human rights should be protected by the rule of law. This is the principle to which the NLD has adhered. During the troubles that have arisen in Rakhine State, we have always kept to this principle, that there must be respect for human rights and there must be rule of law. This is the way in which we can diffuse the tensions that, ha that created the communal violence taking place, well, as not taking place, which took place um, as recently as a few weeks ago. The government has formed a commission to look into the situation in the Rakhine. The NLD is a political party seen as the opposition party, as the major opposition party. We do not want to make political capital out of the situation in the Rakhine state. We want to give the government all the opportunities it needs to diffuse the situation there and to bring about a peaceful settlement. We do not want to criticize the government just for the sake of making political capital. We want to help the government in any way possible to bring about peace and harmony in the Rakhine state. Whatever help is asked from us, we are prepared to give if it is within our ability to do so. But it is not for us, we are not in a position to decide what we do and how we operate because we are not the government. I think this has to be understood by those who wish the NLD to do more. What we can do is to declare our principles and our preparedness to help in every way we can. Human rights and the rule of law, these cannot be ignored if we are to resolve all these communal problems. And that, I think, has to be accepted by all responsible parties. To ignore either human rights or rule of law or to insist on human rights and pretend that rule of, uh, and rule of law is a different matter will not work. Nor will it work the other way around. You, can, you cannot say we must have rule of law, but human rights is something we'll t uh, think about later. These two have to go together. But I, I'm not going to talk about uh, the Rakhine issue in greater detail now. We would, I would also like to talk about the issue of other ethnic nationalities. Fighting has been going on in the Kachin state for some time, and I understand that it, had, it intensified over the last two days. We need to build up ethnic harmony in our country. In the end, harmony can only be brought about well, through no mutual understanding and mutual respect. This does not, uh, th th this cannot be built up quickly, but we have to work at it. And I believe that we need a time frame when we are talking of political settlement. We cannot keep going on and on and on, saying someday we'll get there. We have to have benchmarks. We have to have milestones. We have to know when we want to get to where at what time, and we have to work towards it. Again, this is not what I'm here to talk about principally. I'm here to talk about US-Burma bilateral relations. So what I want to say is that I would like the United States to be aware of our problems. It is only by keeping up an awareness of our problems that we shall be able to establish a strong, healthy relationship between our two countries. I want our countries to be friends. You have been our friend, the friends of the forces of democracy through long years. Now it is time for you to be friends, the friends of our whole country, of the democratic process, of our people, of our aspirations, to be able to help us realize our aspirations. You have to understand what they are. You have to, you have to understand what our needs are. And that
that is what real engagement is, trying to understand one another. We too have to try to understand the United States. It's not a one-way business. It's two-way traffic. Without understanding on both sides, we cannot be real friends and we cannot engage in a positive way. You may say, well, what does Burma have to give the United States? Well, we have a lot to give you. It's not just the economic opportunities for businesses. It's we have, we can give you the opportunity to engage with the people who are ready and willing to change the society. This will give you the opportunity to see how you can work together to change your society. Because I think there are many things in your society that you wish to change as well. I don't think there's a single country in the, in the world that can be said to be perfect. And by helping others, you will also learn how to help yourselves. When you study the problems of a country, you will gain new insights into how you can deal with the problems relating to your own country. When we are studying the problems in the Rakhine state, you will gain greater insight into the wider global problems that exist between the United States and other countries. So I would like US-Burma relations to be a balanced one, a, relation, a relationship that is based on mutual respect, mutual understanding, and genuine friendship. We have a long way to go. I'm very hopeful that Burma will get to the point when we can say, now we are a, a society firmly rooted in democratic values and democratic institutions. I'm now a member of the legislature, so naturally I would like to speak up for the legislature. Uh, it's a very new legislature, very new in more ways than one. The building is absolutely brand new and, uh, and quite impressive, lots of marble and crystal and all that. And uh, we're finding our way. We have been fortunate in that both speakers of uh, the, the assembly, the speaker of the upper house, as well as the speaker of the lower house, has treated us, the very, very small opposition, very, very fairly. They have both gone out of their way to make us feel that we're not discriminated against, that we are given uh, consideration as a, an opposition party. And we have also established good relations with members of other parties, including the USDP. And of course, certainly we have established good relations with members of the ethnic nationality party. We are beginning to learn to work together. We are beginning to learn the art of compromise, give and take, the achievement of consensus. It is good that this is beginning in the legislature and we hope that this will spread out and become part of the political culture of Burma. Because the Burmese political culture has been very weak in negotiated compromises. It is not the way we have worked for a good many years. But if we are to resolve the problems that now face our country, we will have to learn the art of negotiated compromise. And we hope very much that the United States and other friends will help us in this learning process. In the end, US-Burma relations will be what we make of it, we here now, because we are the ones who are going to lay the foundation for the relationship between our two countries. What happens over the next few years will decide how strong and how healthy the relationship between our two countries will be. So I hope that all of you will take this as, uh, as uh, a common task to be carried out together with commitment and with confidence because I am sure that we will succeed in our endeavor not easily, 
There are many, many obstacles in the way, and I'm not going to talk about this because I think when the question and answer session comes, everybody is going to talk about this obstacle, <laughs> and then I will deal with them. So may I just bring my part of this uh, proceedings to a conclusion by saying that I would like to thank all of you for what you have done for our country in the past, and I look forward to the future when we shall be able to do much for one another. Thank you. Tom. Tom Freshman with the uh, Asia Society has an award to present. Could you come up? You are the awardee. <laughs> I'll be, say a thing, few things first, but first, thank you for your very thoughtful and candid comments today. And I, like everyone here, feels very fortunate to be here on the occasion of your first visit to the United States in some 40 years. So if you would permit me, um, for more than three decades, the Asia Society has been recognizing extraordinary individuals who in their lives and professions have contributed to advancing mutual understanding between Asians and Americans in meaningful ways. The Society's Global Vision Award is bestowed upon leaders whose values and actions promote democracy, human rights, justice, and equal access to resources. Da Aung San Suu Kyi embodies these qualities like no other. She was a recipient of Asia Society's 2011 Global Vision Award that was given to her in absentia last January, and we're delighted to have the opportunity to present it to her today in person. Uh, Aung San Suu Kyi is the chair of Burma's leading opposition party, the National League of Democracy, or NLD, and her biography is well known to all and that's been led primarily by her tireless advocacy for democracy and for the rights of her people, much of that achieved over decades of detention. She was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1981 for her lifelong struggle in support of democracy. Aung San Suu Kyi is an inspiration to the people in Burma and to all people in the world. And it's a special honor for me to present this award to her today because I'm a longtime visitor to Burma. I'm a great fan of your country. It's a place that really touches your heart. I first went there in the mid-70s, and I have kept going back probably every year since the year 2000. Uh, there's a lot to love about Burma. Um, it's beautiful, it's bountiful, and I don't think one can find a kinder or more resilient people anywhere in the world. I work with a school, an orphanage, and a medical clinic near Tongyi, which is the capital of the Shan State. And importantly, I was involved in this work by a very great man, uh, Uon Mong, who, a man I know you know well, a patriot and a man who has been one of your close colleagues in the NLD. And we spent many days and many nights going over the years of struggles and triumphs of NLD and the challenge of finding democracy. And through him, I met many other supporters of your party, many of whom had spent time in prison and often under very deplorable conditions. So I have never met you, and it's a thrill for me to do so today. And I got to say that in all my visits to Burma, none were like the one I had last year. I was there uh, last winter, and it was electrifying. And you know, good news is hard to come by these days. So it's been astonishing to see so much good news coming from Burma, of all places. I was there for the campaign season, and it was a marvel just to witness the change in attitude and spirit and uh, in hope of the Burmese who after 50 years, 50 years of pretty much a brutal military dictatorship are awakening at last. Your picture was everywhere I went, hanging in the bazaars and the markets, and it was interesting because even just a few months before it was illegal to even possess the picture. I picked up a few posters and calendars, I got a handbag, it says, <laughs> I heart democracy. <laughs> um, but you had a great victory, and for those of you, as, as you had mentioned, 
The NLD won 43 of the 44 seats that were open for this election. The longing for change in Burma is overwhelming, and while we know there will be obstacles along the way, many of which you've alluded to today, the democracy that you have advocated for and devoted yourself to all your life really seems inevitable. It's a thrill to watch this history being made, and it's a thrill to have you here with us today. So on behalf of Asia Society, it's my honor to call uh, you to the stage. That's what it says here, but you're already on the stage. <laughs> I knew I should have raised that. <laughs> That's all right. It's been uh, great to have you here. But I want this is this is an award in recognition of your decades-long struggle to promote democracy, human rights, and justice. So, let me present this to you. Very tragic. We were scheduled to end at about 1.30, but we're going to stretch it out for about another 10 minutes so that there will be some time for questions. And Colette Rush will join us on the stage, along with Suzanne Maggio. We're going to jump right into it. Uh, my name is Colette. I'm the Tomorrow Dog Center here at the Institute, and it's an honor to co-moderate with my colleague, Suzanne DiMaggio, who is with the Asia Society, their Vice President of Global Policy Projects. And we received a number of questions from Twitter, Facebook, and email. So let's launch right in. Suzanne. Well, first, let me say what a thrill it is to see you again. Welcome back to the United States after so many long decades. I hope you know on this tour you are going to meet uh, probably thousands, if not more, of your supporters and friends. And um, we're looking forward to that. Uh, you spoke a little bit about the obstacles and getting to them in the Q&A section. So this is my and Colette's job. Um, you spoke eloquently about the U.S.-Burma relationship and how far it's come in such a short period of time. And an emphasis has been put on economic issues. Uh, you made the point just now that uh, without rule of law, um, the economy cannot be strengthened in a just way. Uh, now we know that the United States is considering um, a lifting and an easing of the blanket ban on imports from Burma. So my question to you is obviously such a uh, easing would help uh, people in your country uh, in a meaningful way. But do you support such a move now? Uh, if so, why? And if not, what needs to be done to get there? I do, I do sub, uh, support the easing of sanctions because I think that our people must start taking responsibility for their own destiny. I do not think we should depend on U.S. sanctions to keep up the momentum of our uh, movement for democracy. We've got to work at it ourselves. And there are very many other ways in which the United States can help us to achieve our democratic ends can help us to build up the kind of democratic institutions that, that we are in such need of. Sanctions are not the only way. We are very, very grateful for the fact that sanctions were instituted in the past. It helped us great, greatly. I do not agree with those who say that sanctions hurt Burma economically, but they certainly had a very great political effect. And the, the fact that so many people try to blame sanctions for the economic ills of the country only proves how potent it was as a weapon, not that it really hurt us economically. If, if you read the reports of the IMF, I think you will find that sanctions, in fact, had very little economic impact in Burma. I'm going to ask you a question that actually came from uh, Twitter. And the question is, there are a number of ceasefire agreements and peace negotiations ongoing in Burma with the various ethnic groups. What can the Burmese government do to build trust with the ethnic groups and gain their confidence that the government is in fact responsive to their concerns? And what role do you think civil society can play in that peace process in Burma? There has been uh, distrust between strategic distrust, I was going to say, between uh, the ethnic uh, groups 
and the military government of Burma for very many years. And now, although this is a civilian government, you have to remember that most of the members of the civilian government are from the old military government. And besides, the military still has a very powerful position in, ha in the, um, the achievement of ceasefires. For example, the problem now in the Kachin state is that uh, the Kachins believe the uh, ceasefire agreements will not be kept without the compliance of the military. And they are not certain that the military uh, acts in accordance with the directions of the executive. So that's, it's just a question of lack of trust. Nobody trusts anybody else. And that needs time to build up. I think uh, we need to learn more about conflict resolution and negotiation from those who have gone through the same experience. I have spoken to a few people who were involved in conflict resolution and, uh, and resolutions in other parts of the world. And even one session, from, from one session, I learned a lot. So I think we have to learn how to go about it. It's not something that comes naturally. We received a number of questions related to the situation in Rakhine State and also um, the situation with the Rohingya. Uh, a few had asked for clarification. In the past, when you addressed this issue, you noted that this was a uh, situation related to citizenship, and that would be a way to think about it. The questions were, what, did you, what do you mean by that? And looking forward, uh, what is the best way to address this issue? To begin with, I didn't say that it was uh, just to do with citizenship. I was talking about rule of law. And there are many aspects to rule of law. First and foremost, of course, uh, there it was a question of uh, keeping, keeping peace in the area. The very first crime that was uh, committed a few months back, if that had been handled in accordance with uh, rule of law principles, that is to say, action should have been taken quickly, and uh, then justice should not only have been done, but seen to be done, that would have diffused the situation. But because from the very beginning, the basic norms of rule of law were not observed, the whole thing escalated and became worse and worse. And uh, looking at it in the long term, citizenship laws come into it. We have to know who are citizens of Burma in accordance with our citizenship laws. On the other hand, we also have to examine our <coughs> citizenship laws to find out if they are in line with international standards and with basic human rights requirements. So it's not just citizenship laws when we're talking about rule of law. We're just talking about rule of law, meaning to say rule of just laws, citizenship laws, laws of laws to do with crimes. It all started with a crime. And because the way in which the authorities handled it was seen as inadequate, everything became worse. We have time for one more question. I see. <laughs> um, and this actually came from, from an email. And the question is, what can members of the pro-democracy movement, known as the 88 generation, many of whom had been imprisoned in the past, as well as other activists, including exiles, do to contribute to Burma's peaceful transition? What is their role? I don't think that all those who belong to these activist groups have to do just one thing. Each person has his own strengths and weaknesses. Each person has its own talents. I think they have to choose. Some may be best uh, taking part in humanitarian activities. Some may be best going into politics. Some may do best uh, in other directions, such as literature, um, arts, etc. So I don't think that just because they were, have been activists in the past, they all have to be lumped together and that they should all be expected to do just one thing. There are many things that they can do because I assume that each one of them is different. Uh, each one of them is an individual with his own talents, his own inclinations, and his own ambitions. Uh, I don't think they, sh they need to keep together as one organization all the time. They have to expand with the, ex with, with the uh, changing times. 
And then the follow-up question is, is it, are they welcome? Is it, are they open to participate? Where in Burma? But they were, the question was, uh, are, are we talking are about the ones who are living exactly. abroad? Now that, of course, depends on two things. One on the regulations of the government, what, what the regulations are with regard to the status of, for, of each individual, because I don't know that, I, I don't believe they will all fall into one category. And the second thing, will they be work, welcome in Burma? I think so. I think uh, the people in Burma would welcome back any, any of our citizens who have lived abroad for a long time, if they wish to come back. Okay, thank you. And I think on that note, this was a very short Q&A, but we were thrilled to have the opportunity. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I know uh, Jim is going to give some closing remarks, but I do want to tell all of you that this entire um, discussion will be available on our respective websites, usit.org and asiasociety.org. Uh, so please tell your friends and colleagues to view it. I think it was a very important statement from you uh, at this moment. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to our, our partners, the State Department, the Asian Fund, the Blue Moon, pardon me, the Asian Society, Blue Moon Fund, and to all those who have put this together. Uh, we're going to move on San Suu Kyi out of the building. If you just hold tight for just a minute or so, uh, and we'll let you go. We're, we're going to leave right now. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain in your seats until the official party departs.